Welcome back, everyone, to another incredible episode of Chat with Dan here. For today, we have on the show, I mean, what can I say? We have here two incredible, amazing, badass, superstar, I mean, legendary. I mean, what? I mean, you know, it's the perfect way to start a weekend. What can I say, right? We have here uh, uh, Rebecca. She has been on the show previously. And we have Eva here. Two incredible, amazing people, two super badass. And um, yeah, welcome, guys. How are you today? Thanks, Dan. Thank Hi. you. Absolutely. I'm good. I'm doing great. Uh, I'm really excited to be chatting with you and my very, very good friend, Ava. Um, so this is super fun. I, I We are in such three different parts of the world right now. So it's so fun that we can all all gather together. Absolutely. I'm in Canada, for anybody who doesn't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm well as well. It's dark where I'm at already. So it's already a different kind of vibe than with you guys. But I'm super excited. There you go. I love it. Now, I do want to thank also those who are tuning in right now. Thank you so much. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, follow. But also, in the description below, you're going to find all of Rebecca and Eva's social media. Let's follow them. Hashtag Team Rebecca. Hashtag Team Eva. And without further more, let's jump in. So for today, it's going to be basically a whole, well, the main topic of this conversation, right, is how you guys see the whole entertainment and acting industry will be in the next five to ten years, right? So um, my first question that I'm going to ask so we can start is with the rise of streaming platforms and on-demand content how do you foresee the future of traditional of traditional cinema over the next 10 years who goes first you start, oh. you start, buddy. do you want to go first rebecca or do you go you go okay it's just that i have just one thing i i can't i can only see one of you guys on my phone so that's a bit weird because i can't see rebecca like now i can see you because we talked but um, that's okay. I have one thing to say that is maybe like an insider thing is that I, um, I went to Las Vegas in, um, uh, May this year with a friend of mine who has an AI company. And he said that the future of, uh, AI and television is going to be very interesting in terms of the the machines or the program will know it's kind of like you can kind of choose already where the stories are going sometimes like you know like those movies where you can like you can you can see where like you can choose oh i want this to happen or this to happen so what he said is that it's going to develop in a way where you will be the 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 program or the machine will know or the computer the computer or the tv will know um that you're not interested, that you're looking away, that you're like, that you, yeah, your, your attention is going somewhere else and it will change the story according to, um, you know, so, so it can gather, or like get back your attention, which is very scary. So I think if he's saying that this is where it's going, I kind of believe that this is where it's going. I don't know if I like that, but yeah. Um, That's so interesting. Uh, You know, I think until that kind of technology, technology is mainstream i think it, it already is very um very very true of gamers you know gamers are all experiencing that all the time um but until it's mainstream so the rise of 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 um reality tv i've always found really interesting because this is what people want people want not just reality tv in the sense of like some reality tv you know, is really real people in the world. And another whole brand of reality TV is this put on reality TV energy. So it's all scripted. It's all a voice like this. It's very different. It's like its own thing. And people really love it. They love to be able to give only mid attention. They love to be able to gossip about it. They love to be able to feel included. So I think that both of those kind of uh, new branches that have uh, happened in the past, you know, 30 years, let's say, um, those are important to pay attention to. There's still going to be uh, narrative, you know, film and TV because we love story in that way, like as a people. But I think it's really important to see that it's no longer the only stream. It's going to be one of three. And we have to pay attention to that. So because there's so much content, I don't think necessarily actors will lose all their jobs or anything because there's room for all of it. But in a very kind of optimistic way, I think there's room for everything. Um, but it has to be boundaried and it has to be clear. 
so that people can get what they want as opposed to it's not going to work to fight to not let technology take over in the ways in the areas it doesn't work fighting technology fighting progress has never worked so it's like how do we really i think that these lanes will become clearer in the next five to ten years yeah. absolutely i agree and what i think is what's going to be very important is like you say with those reality tv shows it's it does two things it gives you Sometimes it gives you fake authenticity, but it's somewhat, those people are authentic, right? There are, and it's heightened. It's not like, it's not just cooking, like things are happening. It is heightened reality, just like film and TV is heightened reality. Like there's so many things happening in order for us to keep engaged. And then the other thing, uh, so the first thing is authenticity. And the second thing is like, it makes you, because we're so isolated in our own worlds, right? that you feel like you have friends, even if they're not your actual friends, right? I think that's what social media does a lot as well. At least that's what I experience or where I go with my social media, let's say. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's very different because I watch The Sopranos over and over again because I love being around Tony. I'm just like, I want to I wanna hang out with you. But it's a very, very large added layer of accessibility to feel like those people not only do they exist beyond being characters, but I could even touch them maybe, you know? So it's really, it's interesting. But again, we cannot, we cannot turn away from this as opposed to saying one is right, one is wrong. We shouldn't, we should. This prescriptive way of thinking is not useful, but I do think it is important to, to listen to um, the intelligent people, the elders, to listen to them, but again, at the same time, not to to try and stop progress. It has to be a balance. Okay, yeah. okay. And how do you think advancements in technology, you know, like uh, uh, deep fake AI and virtual reality, will influence the acting profession? You're going first again. <laughs> I can go first again. <laughs> I don't know. I think it can backfire, but at the same time, I I mean, I, I see what's happening now with, um, there are those avatars of like Kylie, not Kylie Jenner, the other one, the other Jenner. Kendall? Uh, Kendall Jenner, yes. There's a, an avatar of Kendall Jenner and of some basketball players and you can, they, you can talk to them uh, as if they were your friends is this where it's going i mean right now it's i feel like it's going nowhere yet because if i look at um martin scorsese's um that movie the three hour long movie where they made robert de niro young like it's still kind mm -hmm. of in baby shoes like it just didn't look very good i guess it's something to look better and i just think it maybe it'll be just a little bit soulless I don't know. That's where I think it's going. It's just a little bit soulless when when you know that the person isn't real. Like there's nothing real about it. There's the 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 voice isn't real. It's not like a cartoon because a cartoon at the end of the day there's something maybe real about it because there's still a, a real voice behind it. I don't know. It feels cartoonish to me. Mm -hmm. For now. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like I have watched some of the Harry Potter in Italy stuff. <laughs> have you seen this? Like no. it's so good. It's just like they take the Harry Potter characters and they put them in Italy. And I've you know I haven't watched a ton of this, and that was really quite good. Um, but it does still feel like very very well produced cartoon. Um, so cartoon like you know I don't cartoon almost sounds like a, a, a animation. Um, mm -hmm. And that I found interesting, um, but here's the thing. I'm not sure, I don't know. Like I really don't know. Cause I know I really want things to be from people. I like that. I like knowing that this is a person who's done it. But if nobody had told me that the Italian Harry Potter wasn't people and I'm just perusing among my day, I just believe it's people. So if I can tell it's AI, I don't like that. But if I can't tell, I just think it's people. So I'm fooled. So I'm fooled into believing that I'm still sticking within my values. So once, as you mentioned, it's it's not necessarily there yet. But once it's there, once there's a world of, I can't tell the difference as an audience member, 
then it's a, then it's dangerous. Then we really need protection and rights and all that stuff. But for now, most of the time we can tell the difference. So that's still the protection mechanism. Also, the world loves stars. We like to be able to look up who is in the show I'm watching. Oh, I like this character. What else have they done? Maybe that's just actors. I'm like, what else have they done? Oh, who are they? Wait, isn't that that person from this show? Wait, isn't that that person that was married to that person for a year? Like, I'm I'm not even somebody who like is into gossip columns or anything like that, but I like <laughs> to know what else have you done? I like you. I, I the the you know, I remember when um uh what is it? Uh James Gandolfini's son is is in um what's that show with Maggie Gyllenhaal and uh James Franco, The Deuce. And okay. he's he's in like Uh, season two and I was like who's this weird kid and like what is happening I was so excited to go and find out about him if I don't get to play that game of who are you then I feel there's a little bit of a loss of appeal for me like if I had found out that that AI made Drake song if I find out it's not Drake I'm not gonna I'm disgusted I feel fooled I feel ambushed I don't like it And if you knew it up front that it was an AI song, would that change everything? If you, if everything was disclosed and they would say, okay, this is an AI song, we didn't do that, but it is like Drake's voice sort of generated. He put it like, it's his original voice. It's just, you know, the words are being put together. Is that going to be different then? Well, I I would be like, okay, I'm going to listen a lot harder. I'm going to be more critical. Um, but no, the song was good. This is the thing. It's like, you we hear it, the song is good. And so what happens to me is I go, oh, wow, this is going to be a lot harder on the music industry than it is going to be on us. That's what it, that's what my reaction was. It's like, because it's very different to, even when we watch something, let's say this, the shortest show we watch is half an hour. A song is two to three minutes. These days, two minutes. So it's like, so many of the sounds of the music of the of the of the like uh audio that is used on tiktok or on reels is ai but i don't think about it i do not care in the same way so it's like what's to say that won't happen in these in these longer you know uh types of of art i don't know we didn't answer your question we just talked about it (laughs) (laughs) No, you did. You did. You know, the the, the other day I was, uh, I saw a, a, a couple of months ago, I think, that there was this rapper, who was he? Eminem, that they release a song or like, so, or like they use a program by an AI so he can make the chorus for a song. And it went into this huge discussion because he didn't do it, but they use an AI for, to kind of replicate his voice. So, you, you know, so they can put it. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit kind of, a, I think that for the music industry, that's going to be a lot more complicated you know or things or 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 we'll get musicians like into trouble you know things like that so yeah yeah Yeah. i mean they already get they already have trouble small musicians at least like or like you know not very well known they already have trouble getting paid properly with all these you know like spotify and whatnot they get barely any money so But there is never any money in the arts, right? It's always been like that. There's always been huge families or kings or courts that were the sponsors of of artists. I think that's just going to maybe shift and morph somehow in a different way. But very rare for artists to make money, right? So like for for actors, like how many are true stars? Like 2%, 5% of actors are true big... how many can live even like oh that. yeah look at what the like the sag after strikes like what 75 percent of the actors in sag don't even get social insurance i mean you know it's like <laughs> yeah. it's crazy but that's not what we kind of do it for right i'd say yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now with many actors transitioning uh, to roles behind the camera, such as you know directors or producers, uh, producers as well, do you see this trend intensifying in the near future? I'll go first. Have okay. A... <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if it's a trend because I don't think it's new. Um, I will say that now, um, 
there's a lot less barriers to all types of people, not just white men going into directing, going into producing. So I do think that the um, diversity of this progression or this jump uh, is going to, is going to augment, you know, but um, it's always been, it's always been the way. Um, anybody with a name is a producer. Like if you're a name as an actor, you're hopping on to produce. It's a very, very, like very immediate jump. Um, also people begin to approach you with projects when you have a name. So if you bring a project to, even you bring it to a director, you bring it to a producer, you all of a sudden are a producer. If you've brought it, you're a producer. So it's, it's a lot smoother of a jump than we think. Um, for those who are really kind of progressing from one career to the next, I think um, I do think because technology has become more accessible, education has become more accessible because there's less of this gatekeeping around, well, oh no, you need to be this. You don't, you can, anybody can access. Uh, this access point lets people believe that they can, so they do. So I do think that, again, it's not a trend, but the way accessibility to TV and film has opened up for everyone, whether they're actors or not beforehand, it's just, it's just the, it's just so much easier to do these things than it used to be. And I think also for actors, it's a way of maybe regaining a little bit of power because in our profession, we have so little of it in terms of um, how are we going to get, like, are we going to get that audition? There's so many people, you know, we walk in, there's 15 other people who look just like us who are there for the same part. Um, and as we, for me, at least as I move on in my life and in my career, I want to have more control over what I can do and what I, what I can play. And this is, I think, where a lot of actors see their opportunity nowadays, where it's easier to either film yourself or find somebody to film or, you know, uh, when you're with people together, you can produce something together and it can be successful because you can put it online and somebody can see it, right? If you go, if you want to go this way. So I think for me, a big part is having that control over my own career. Yeah. So I think more, and I see it more and more online, it's merging. It's not merging in Europe. It's very much still divided, uh, the internet and and whatever is considered real, you know, TV or, or a real story. But I see it more and more in the US, how people who started off in social media then go into their own, uh, they produce their own little shows and then they go into streamers or sell something or start with a play and then, uh, go on and, and produce a TV show or a movie. So like Rebecca said, it's always been this way, but I think it's definitely being made easier by the technology that we have nowadays. All right. Love it. Such epic answers. Now, as the world <laughs> becomes like more, you know, um, environmentally conscious, how might the industry adapt in terms of film production practices and on set sustainability? So in Europe, if I may start, there's been um, productions, I think in Austria, some of them, they even have to be, or they get, no, they get incentives. They get incentives if they're being called, if they can call themselves a green production. Um, I don't know how much of it, you know, how much greenwashing there is happening, but there is, there, there's definitely a big push towards um whatever, using less plates and having people use reusable cups and 5,000 bottles of plastic water. So, so there's definitely more consciousness towards being green. I just think that sometimes it's still, it's not as well implemented yet, at least here. I don't know how it is in Canada right now. I mean, in Canada, I like, do I know, do I even know? Do I have really the, the information about this? I do know there's incentives. I do know that there are companies that you can hire on sets to come and greenify your set. Um, I know that when I shoot in Montreal, they're very good with it. That is really part of the culture. Um, 
that we are served our food in like metallic things that we bring back, you know. Um, Winnipeg was actually pretty good too. Everything was always on plates. Uh, but, and this is something that's been kind of brought to my attention more and more. Um, it's not on the, uh, the greenness we're looking for is not coming from our plates. That's not the problem. The problem is the type of vehicles we use, the amount of energy we use, the type of energy we use, um, the like uh, amount of money spent on you know certain things versus other things. It's like what what would actually help, right? Like if we're using renewable energy, okay, for example, that's that's going to make a difference. Um, what is our output uh, as far as like waste? waste not just in um in plastic bottles and plates but like waste of energy um you know like to light a scene the amount of lights of 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 people of stuff it's like oh, how are we reducing so it's not just about reducing what the actors and the crew use to eat you know it's like it's it's who are you hiring as your caterers? Who are you hiring as your production teams? Like, what kind of trucks are you using? What companies that you're ordering all of your equipment from? Like, what what do they represent? So, um, and I'm talking out of my ass because I don't actually have the numbers. I don't actually know. So I just yeah, want to be like, how, yeah, or like, how many people do you have to fly somewhere, and how many planes do you have to use, and how many people come in on on private jets and whatnot? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, like how these idling, um, what are they called? The uh, the things they put us in. What are they called again? Trailers. The trailers. <laughs> idling trailers with the electricity on. Do you know what I mean? Like th this kind of stuff, I think is much more important than waste on set. You know, and um, I mean, as a general being generally conscious of, of, you know, where do you, like you said, like, where do you get the crew from? Like, is it, if you can keep as many things as possible local, I think that would reduce it greatly. Right. But, you know, although the Americans coming up to Canada to shoot, I mean, those are like, I don't know how many planes. Although uh, Sophie Coppola shot a movie in Toronto, which is the new Priscilla movie. And other than the two leads, everyone is Canadian. Everyone is not just Canadian, but local. And if Sophie, if it's good enough for Sophia Coppola, everybody, then why maybe it's not like, maybe it's about the director, you brats. Anyway, <laughs> resentful at all. <laughs> all right. And, um, do you anticipate a shift in the type of stories and narratives that will be popular or per, or you know important in the next decade? Yes. Because, Please go ahead. Yeah, no, I I'm I'm passionate about this one. So uh this has been already happening. So when the streamer is discovered that specific stories would fly and gain popularity and make them money such as stories about you know a young muslim girl or uh, an orthodox jewish boy or you know what i mean like a family of vietnamese people settling in a canadian city whatever it is korean and the one i'm thinking not vietnamese but still that would be great um they've discovered that there's money in this so the reality is if there's no money in it, it's not going to happen. But now that there is money in it, people will be telling these different stories. Not only that, there's so many funds and so much access given to folks that were previously not allowed into the community that there's no longer this lie that in a rom-com, it has to be two good looking white people. We, we've we seen with so many projects that nobody cares. We're interested in the quality of content. We're interested in the uh, uh, like we want charisma we want um why can't i think of words ever we want uh, uh what is the oh, word? relatability yeah relatability and chemistry and so like whatever has that that we're we're down so here's something because the streamers caught on to this there was a lot of like tokenist stories a lot of stories were told just to try and fill a quota but of course it's a pendulum swing 
The reality is these folks um, who previously weren't allowed to, to write these stories are now able to write the stories. So even though at first it was still white people writing stories and putting in a person of color or putting in someone like from a marginalized community to get viewers or get like PC attention. Now, luckily it's, it's continuing to move the machine. Whereas the writers and the creators are actually the people who are telling the stories of their communities who are telling the stories of their cities, as opposed to it just being like a badge of, of progressiveness, which is really, really cool. So I think, yay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think it is quite a slow machine, though. Like, I, there's still, I saw yesterday that UCLA came out with a statistic where only 6% of all, I don't know if leads or not, but they are Asian, from like Asian descent. So it's, I mean, you see it more and more, but there's still so much room for improvement. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. I do think that people is is like waiting for that, you know, like like begging for really interesting stories, narratives, uh, things like that, you know, because more of the same has become like a little bit boring, right? Especially, for example, something that um, that got my attention the other day is the whole Marvel situation that right now they're just releasing content and people just don't care anymore. They just want something else. You know, regardless of how, like, they're really trying to push, like, to add something new, people just, you know, they they want something else, so. And at the same time, you see something like Barbie. Barbie is kind of like a play on what has always been given, and it's an interesting angle. It was a, a really, really well done story, really, really great performances, and so, you know, you can do the same thing, but you've got to do it a little bit better. We're not, we're not just, it's not just going to keep pumping if there's not any originality or something in it. Uh, I did want to say something else about, oh yeah, here's another thing. Um, People are writing more for characters as they exist in the world. Again, like this world of reality TV, it's like to, to be, you know, to be, um Lebanese second generation from Montreal for example is a very particular thing to be you know Armenian from New York is a very particular thing and as opposed to just having a Lebanese person and an Armenian person or Armenian is still a white person but like whatever somebody who who has an Armenian look in your show so that you've checked the boxes these characters are now written with the rich history they have as being a second generation of this or somebody who's who, you know, has been in a country for five generations, but still maintains like the the type of personality style, the type of community. You know what I mean? Like there's so much wealth that people are writing about as opposed to just popping a, a like a person with a specific background to to cover their bases, which I yeah, think. Yeah. Is- yeah. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, and to 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 make it a cliche, basically, that's what we're trying to get out of. Is yeah. we're as before, we're putting it, putting in people into shows to have diversity, but sort of make them a cliche. Now, a person uh, is not only defined by their skin color in the in the movie, but by everything else that they have experienced, right? So they're a full fleshed person instead of just being like this this outline of a of a of a of a caricature almost but i want to be a little bit of a devil's advocate about barbie i love the movie and everything but if i were to be a devil's advocate it's still a movie with a very classic storyline you know it's the hero's journey and it's two white people being the leads one of them one of the most like like one of the the, the two most successful white actors in hollywood <laughs> so you were know. illustrating the Barbie and Ken in the world. So yes, a hundred percent. And also the director slash writer and co-writer are both really successful to white people. I'm with you, but that story is a very specific story about two white stereotypical idols. So that one we couldn't replace, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Not to be, but I'm, but I'm with you. I'm with you. I will ask you, Ava, and you can tell me so I don't know if you know this, Dan, but Ava speaks five languages. Um, and that's bad. So it was well, four. <laughs> you speak fluently. Five. Four, four fluently. Four. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, so it's funny, like how often when you, especially when you lived here, um, did you go out for roles 
that said German girl, Russian girl, Polish girl. You know what I mean? Like, as opposed to them even having names and like how much has changed from back then? Uh, unfortunately, maybe not so much. Oh, really? <laughs> there goes my point. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, honestly, especially also like, I don't want to go back about Europe. I'm happy to work. Um, <laughs> it's bad. bad start. I don't have the part, but not have the part. I get typecast quite often, you know? So yes, I, it's always been, I guess, you know what? I guess in Canada, it was even more diverse than it is nowadays. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, so definitely some of them didn't have names. And yes, it's always a cliche. It's always the poor Eastern European, you know, mm. either some refugee or a prostitute. I played like four or five prostitutes <laughs> in the past two years, three years. Yeah. Uh, is that getting better? I don't know. I, I think I'm not the one to answer. Like, I hope like right now, I would say it's still the same, but maybe the characters are getting more fleshed out. Mm -hmm. good yes yes I'd say that yeah I'd say that just to say something positive <laughs> and also they probably don't call the character uh you know Polish prostitute they probably give her a name they give her a name yes they do they give her a name but otherwise yeah very often it was just but you know like there's tons of you know girl one girl two sexy girl something right I mean yeah. not for me but <laughs> there, there are oh. those yeah. <laughs> yeah hot girl number two yeah exactly yeah but those those don't yeah. exist anymore. You can't necessarily call on for hot girl number two anymore. That, that is industry great. no longer allows that. You're definitely now that was great. <laughs> <laughs> <Bailey>. <laughs> Yeah, I've been like Kitty and Cherry and oh my god, I don't even really? know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes I, yeah that's crazy that's, exactly that, what... that's crazy you know something that that stills happen even to this day on film whenever they will portray mexico it's always yellow i don't understand why but every single time they put like a shot in mexico it's yellow and our, you know and 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 here we just we always make make jokes about that like do people think that we see everything yellow or what is going on here that that's every, so that, funny that every single time like 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 literally like in all films whenever they would put like a scene in mexico boom yellow always yellow and you know it's something <laughs> that 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 even till this day gets my attention and also that for for example if they're gonna if they're gonna put mexican yeah like mexican people into the film Usually they put people from like from other countries. The other day I had an interview with um uh, with uh with an Spanish actress, and she was telling me that that yeah I mean her her language is is Spanish but she's from Spain and it's so interesting that when she goes to audition like most of the times that they 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 will try to put her to to be like okay try to speak with a Mexican accent and she's like no but you know that's not how i you know so that's so that is something that even to this day gets my attention that for that for that for situations when they when they go to mexico they will put people who don't speak spanish at all or they speak spanish but not like you know not, not like us locals so it mm -hmm. tends so it tends to be funny for us to be like okay so it's another one of those it's going to be yellow and there's going to be some <laughs> some random people trying to speak like they're us but you know yeah so, hola yeah. Donde es, you know, like yeah, kind of yeah, French. yeah. Like for example, mm -hmm. uh, on Breaking Bad, incredible yeah. show. I loved it. One of my favorites by uh by by far. But it was so funny that whenever they would go to Mexico, they were portrayed by by other by other, by actors that they're not Mexican at all, right? And I was like, like what is going on? Or, or like for example, they will use uh Giancarlo Esposito, an incredible actor. I mean, he's by far one of my favorites, and he was gonna play an actor from Chile. You know, and even though he was trying to speak Spanish, he was, you know, he was sounding that Spanish was not his, you know, like his native tongue. So I'm, I'm, I'm really waiting, and I'm really hoping that at some point we, we, we get like the opportunity to see locals on the, you know, on their projects because it also gives the opportunity to people there to kind of show themselves to be like, you know, what here we have talent also, you know, we have actors too, you know, things like that. So, yeah, it, it, it's always really frustrating when I'll go out for a part for a French person. Um, And then the person they cast, I hear them speaking French. And I'm like, you don't speak French. You speak French horribly. I'm like, why didn't you choose me? I speak French so well. But it has nothing to do with that, right? It's always just about the energy. They don't, they don't, it, depending on the audience, they could not care less. Yeah. 
But I think that's the paradox with the, the US and Canada in terms of languages. Like they pay so much attention to what the accent is in English. So there can't be even a little bit of a problem with the accent or like, you know, like a little bit of a, of a weirdness to the accent in English itself. Yeah. But once it's once the person has to speak another language, they don't they don't care how it sounds. Yeah. You know, so so that's something that I always found frustrating for me <laughs> but but yeah very true so yeah. self-centered mm -hmm. so self-important anyway, anyway i'm not mad no it's funny as i <laughs> said i mean not? i I, I, I mean i just as i said here when that happens i mean i just laugh about it like okay it's one of those yellow scenes now wow. and yeah it's but 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 you know i'm serious that i'm i was speaking with a friend of mine like the like what you know like do really people think that we that Mexico is yellow? Like literally, when you are flying, then you will they will be telling you like we're landing in Mexico, and then when you turn your window, everything's yellow now. Like what is going on here? That every single time we're yellow. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's um, not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. But anyway, now how do you think the role of uh, film festivals will evolve? You know, giving the increasing accessibility of digital platforms for showcasing new talent. You go first. Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, what comes to my mind is what comes to mind is that it's always about networking, and I think those festivals are not so much about. I think I think they're about networking, and I think it's good to go. They're all they're. I think they're always going to be there just because of the prestige of Khan or Sundance or Tribeca, um, and. At the end of the day, in any industry, you want to meet people, you want to meet like-minded people, you want to exchange ideas, and festivals are a really good way of doing so. Um, so I think they'll definitely prevail. I, yeah, I'm not sure how, I mean, it's always, you know, the thing with with those kind of festivals that they, they promote cinema that usually will might not you know be seen in other parts of the world so if a polish movie wins con or has you know gets something at con at least it'll be played everywhere you know it'll be played in cinemas all over the world because it, it won that prize and it so it's definitely i think they're important they're important for people to see something else than a marvel movie and and mm -hmm. have access to something else than the marvel movies because at the end of the day, film is art. And I mean, Marvel movies are art on and it's and somewhere in their own way, but they're just very much business. And it's hard to show business is hard because it is art and yet it has to be a business. So I think festivals will prevail in terms of being able for people to network and being able to promote something that is extraordinary so that other people can see it, not just the the small crowds of, of, you know, cineast and cines, like, uh, movie lovers. That's, that's what I think. Hopefully. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, I would say that uh, what I understand also is that festivals are, are markets. So it's like, they go mm -hmm. to shop, people go to buy movies, people go to, um, again, what you said, reinforce relationships and, and, and all this stuff. And, and, it has very little to do with um, kind of what you were talking about, like uh, the the love of art. It's more of this is the business and a festival is just a business meeting in a sense, you know what I mean? Where you're seeing the goods. It's like, it's like going to um, Art Basel. You might be going to Art Basel because you love art, but you're also probably shopping. There's a whole world of collectors. There's a whole world of like, you know, these relationships, it's a, it's a big, big meeting. It's an international meeting. Um, so for that, I don't think festivals will go anywhere. Um, also, people like to party. You know, it's like mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to get together with people, to meet people you've wanted to meet and to have a nice time. Like every single industry has conferences. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of a huge conference. So uh, these things are necessary. Um, because there is something more to, there's something different to face-to-face -face meetings than being online or on the phone. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. As far as like giving opportunities to people, yeah, giving opportunities to film films. But you know, what I will say is 
what I was told is that uh, those who make it are those who stick around. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if you're really good and you're in a movie at con, you're going to get recognition probably more quickly than if you had stayed in whatever country the movie you made was in. And like, there's certain countries that have bigger film industries. There's certain folks who have the ability to go move to those countries with bigger film industries. Like, there's a lot, but um, I don't think being in a movie at con will make or break your career. Uh, I think that anybody who's doing well in TV and film is either like there's the few we think of like, oh, well, at 16, she was in this movie and she was so beautiful. It's like, great. If you don't have ability, if you don't have consistency, if you don't have tenacity, it's not going to happen. Like you got to, you got to keep, keep going. And so whether you're in a film festival, they're not, they're not star makers. Like, yes, they can be a really, really wonderful place to get a lot of attention, but you were already good to get that attention. This idea that there's only this one opportunity that if you miss this or if we no longer have festivals that people won't have the same access to, to making it, I don't think is true. I think that if you have skill and tenacity and perseverance and, and uh, you know, a desire to keep creating, it's not about, it's not about like a home run, a single home run, I don't think. So um, that's not really the question. I think, I think festivals will stick around and still be useful, but not in the way where they nobody's coming to save anybody nobody's saving you nobody's saving me no movie will save a person you can do a really good movie and then do absolutely nothing you're not going to be earning any money if you're doing absolutely nothing do you know what i mean oh yeah for sure, for sure. yeah and the, the thing about what you said about business sorry i just want to say that because in austria it's or in europe in general i don't know about other parts of europe but i know about austria it's very much not a business model movies are not a business model there's hardly ever a movie that made so much money that you can say it was successful this is all whatever movies like m the money that is used to make movies here is public money it's public it's public funding so you apply for grants and then you're able to make a movie um, so it's a very different model and if the movie makes money sometimes you pay you pay some of it back back into the funds so somebody else can use it right so so it kind of opens up the possibility for for you not to have to think okay how do i construct a story for it to make money uh but you can give yourself uh, some freedom some artistic freedom in it that said it is a very closed in industry it's very clubbish is that a word like you know it's very like there's yeah, a cliquey. Yeah, yeah. it's very cliquey yeah yeah so so there's other obstacles that come in the way but I think that is a nice thing that that they have the opportunity to to just simply make art because it's considered valuable what they do and not just um valuable in terms of revenue mm. yeah. in France if you are an artist and you've banked whatever the amount of allotted hours, 500 hours as an artist, you, if there are months that you're not making money, the government pays your living wage. Mm -hmm. Like it's, there's such a, according to what country you're in, uh, there's such a different relationship to being a participating artist in your country, in your community. It's, it's really, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. I, and look, I'm I'm happy to be in Canada. We shoot a lot. We shoot a lot of stuff. So like I'm taking I'm ta I chose that one. That's the thing I chose. Quantity. <laughs> it's so true. Anyway, it's funny. No offense. Like I still have quality stuff, but I chose quantity. You know. Fair enough. All right. Now, how do you feel about the rise of short form content? You know, like we see, like what we see on TikTok, YouTube. You know. So do you think that this will influence the type of content produced or the length of films or shows in the future? I, I, if you don't answer this first, nothing is right with the world. <laughs> I live for short form. <laughs> 
I think short form is great. <laughs> I mean, I think it's sad that people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, and I am uh, very much guilty of it, and I contribute to that as well. But um, I see more and more high quality content, like little scenes shot so beautifully on TikTok, where I think, oh my goodness, I want to do that. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's going to contribute to the length of feature films that we have nowadays talking about Scorsese again who just brought out a three and a half hour movie that was really interesting and even I wasn't bored <laughs> um so I think it's wonderful and I can see the quality getting better and better of course there's a lot of crap if I can say that out there there's really there's, there's just so much you have to you have to weed through the the endless um terrible things that you see online and very very low quality but I think I think some people who know how to use it they'll they'll do a great job and maybe there'll be some new formats that that'll that'll arise from it definitely. Yeah. Yeah, no I'm I'm also one to celebrate uh this it, we can't even call it short form cuz it used to mean something else but very short short form. Um yeah. Also this is what the people want. There's so much to that. It's like this is what we're attracted to. And um, it's beautiful. It's done so well. Also, you know, I think that short form or or like I should say TikTok length makes it accessible for people. Like I know Ava has, you know, a very um, enthusiastic following because of how accessible your content is. Um, and not only that, but I remember even when you would make the YouTube uh, uh, small short things you would make back in the day it's like I love them they're so fun and they allow for creativity they allow for an expansion of of what's on the table to make like back in the day not too long ago it was like tv film news porn like what, what that that's what we had and now we have everything and sure that can be overwhelming but and this is one area where I really I really like what AI is doing is algorithmically like we are seeing what we want to see. We are given little outside bumpers to see like, are you also interested in this? Are you also interested in this all the time? So algorithmically, it's a beautiful marriage, short form content and the algorithms. And, and what I love to hear is that this high end content that's being made does performs better so there is something to be said about production value performance quality of writing we haven't lost this this is not going anywhere so the big complaint of tv and film is like anybody can grab their phone it's like no we did that we got there we went to that place where anybody could grab their phone and now algorithmically that does not do well what does well is well produced or star quality those things are what are algorithmically <laughs> successful and so this is comforting to me. You still mm -hmm. need talent. And so uh, people have the talent and they're succeeding in this open market. And that's really cool. And I also, it like, it loops back to authenticity. I think people can feel what is authentic and what is not. And this is what gets pushed. Because if it's not authentic, I can I can just speak like from my own experience. When I film something and I feel like it's not, I can feel, oh, I felt that. It's authentic. And then it performs well because I know it's authentic. So so there is something sad, for, sad to that, that that people people feel something feels real. There's some some spark in it that that touches them or that they can relate to. And it's not um it's not fake or it's not you know there's effort put into it and the people the, who made it they meant it and you can feel that and i think that what what performs well and i think this is also where ai is going to to not ever maybe take the upper hand in, in those terms because people will crave that human connection with something right and they will some of it, some people will get it in AI because you can see it nowadays that people, you know, marry a, a, some game character or or some people take comfort in talking to, you know, Siri. Yes, there are those people, but but the majority, I think, will crave the authentic human connection. Hmm. 
Yeah, we're still fed milk from our mother's bosom, you know? Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I like that one. That was deep, you know? That was like dropping the mic. <laughs> I hung out with a baby yesterday. It was really fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so cute. Awesome. It's like a month old. Ugh. <laughs> At 10. There you go. There you go. Now, as global politics and social, you know, issues become more intertwined with entertainment, do you see actors taking on more activist roles in the future? Actually, no, I don't. Yeah. Um, and I'll say that because people are afraid of cancel culture. Um, and you will, if you take a stance, you're canceled by one group. And we're taught, you know, to, I imagine, stay pretty neutral so that anyone will hire us. I think that some people who have already a very established kind of uh, name presence will maybe take a side, but cancel culture is scary, I think. Um, you know, yeah, I, I feel that for myself. I sometimes I'm Sometimes it's better just to not say anything, <laughs> you know, which I don't know. I don't know if that's the way to go. You know, I feel like right now, especially in the U.S., it's very difficult to say, to say whatever, to say, to speak your mind. Yeah. It's very difficult. Yeah. I was also like what the I don't think people should be speaking quite as much as they should unless they they really understand what's going on or they're like promoting sources of folks who are who really understand what's going on. and. Um, you know, I very much don't want to get into the um, Israel conflict um, and Palestine conflict, but uh, yeah. a lot of people are really quick to take very, very stark sides. And that is, you know, inevitably painful. Um, then again, like if you talk to me about abortion rights in the U.S., I'm very clear on on where I stand and and I would happily say it to anybody but when it has like I don't know it's like what 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 height of consequence what height of 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 knowledge is required like I don't know yeah. there's also human rights versus opinions um you know it's like I you can I you stand behind human rights doesn't mean you have like uh, you're saying one group is bad and one group is good. You're saying I stand for human rights. So it's, it's really, it's really, it's really tricky and, um, and not tricky in the way of like, Oh, should I should or shouldn't I for my career? Fuck that. But it's tricky in the way of like, we're all fallible. We don't know everything. And to come up and just like, loudly state something is really problematic because we all now have a voice and they're the voices of, of famous people are amplified anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how do you think the role of importance critics and film critics will change in the digital area in which basically everyone can be a reviewer right now I don't remember the last time. I I mean I do read the Guardian's uh, some um re reviews sometimes and maybe the New York Times reviews, but I think I, I for me I feel like people took over. Um, did they? I don't know. Did people take over the the sides of the critics? Like, is it now by popularity? I feel like sometimes it is. Nowadays, I try to just like go into a movie and not have any opinion about it. Just like I want to see something and something interests me and I'm going to go see it and I'm going to be the old, the the one critic. But that's because I I know about film and I've been watching movies for as long as I can remember. Um, yeah, I don't know if critics have such a huge impact nowadays as they used to do when there was only newspapers or... I don't think so, but that's also, that's a very uneducated guess that I'm taking right now. Um, yeah, no, I personally uh, have some friends that I, uh, that I speak to about film and TV, whose opinion I really respect whether we differ or not. And I love to talk about 
TV and movies. You know, I love to take it apart, talk about performances, um, talk about what I like, what I didn't like. But um, one of my friends I'm thinking of, she loves reviews. She loves reading articles about movies. I never find myself interested in doing that. Um, and there's also a certain, I think, like hierarchy of whose opinion and whose um, point of view is is superior as far as like being like knowledgeable or pedantic or or of quality or whatever. And I'm I don't really feel like that's something that works in the world anymore. Uh, I think about this. I think th this might be my Roman Empire. I think about how J. Crew and Ralph Lauren have died as brands um, or really transformed. They used to be the height of like what anybody would want. The American coastal upper middle class Ivy League energy like that used to be the thing. And now nobody cares. They're like, I don't look like that. I don't want to look like that. That's not who I am. So it's like there's no longer these folks leading our opinions in an outright way. It is all sneaky now. It's all algorithmic. It's all social media. It's all campaigns. It's all showing us what it's, you know, voter fraud. It's all that. So do I trust anything? It's no. Yeah. It's like, it's good marketing. Like let's take Barbie, right? Their marketing campaign was, I don't know how many millions of dollars, right? So they did a great job there. And then on the other hand, I feel like like a regular person who is not into movies, I'd go on to Rotten Tomatoes and see what the critics like and what the, what the, you know, what the, you can vote for either. Like you can see what the critics said and what the regular people said. And this is where I form my opinion about a movie and then I go and see it or I won't, you know? I feel, I don't know if so much thought is being put into what people see nowadays, especially like when you go to the movies. Do people go to the movies as much as they used to? Well, you know what's funny? The amount of money that was spent on the last Indiana Jones movie as far as marketing, it was a billion dollars, which is incredible. And they had tons of marketing and they did not do well. So it's like, I don't know. It was Has the movie been even out? I haven't even... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Harrison Ford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And, uh, and uh, what's what's her name? I love her. Phoebe Waller-Bridge was in it, right? He is? See, if I'd known yeah. that... Yeah, she's in it. She plays with his daughter. Yeah, but oh, the wow. movie, but the movie was like really, 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 really bad received for for the. Oh audience. really? Yeah, terrible. Oh wow, that's yeah. too bad. Yeah, Phoebe. Yeah, that's the thing. Is that the audience at the end of the day, the audience decides. That's why like People's Choice Awards and stuff like that, and that's why like popularity online. I mean, look at that. Look at look at what what the masses can do when you look at TikTok whatever her, I don't know her name but the one who's like the most famous Bella Porch who has a hundred million followers or more on TikTok she like that's the power of the masses can do so much even though it's like now I mean this politically elections in Poland just happened more people went to vote than in nine than, than when you know the the wall fell and communism ended so there's definitely something to say to be said for for the power of the masses, especially with women. When women, yes. I, I saw this Harvard thing. I, yeah, I saw this Harvard. Uh, I saw it on TikTok, but it was a Harvard <laughs> professor. <laughs> I read this Harvard study. <laughs> it was a Harvard study made that the only change that's ever going to happen is when women start, you know, start the revolt. And it's made in a way where it's not harmful. It's not, it's not, vol it's not, uh, brutal you know but mm -hmm, women mm -hmm. have to women have to step in which they often can't because of the political situations but that is just, <laughs> i'll stop here because i don't know anything about it so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my tiktok knowledge <laughs> yeah yeah it's crazy you know usually what i do if i um yeah if a show or a film gets released I tend to see some reviews from like, you know, like main ones, but sometimes I will choose like, you know, like a regular, you know, like some other, like without, without like an agenda to it, you know, because sometimes like those type of, re of reviewers, like official and big ones will have like agendas, no matter what they release, sometimes they will, they will go easy on it, you know? And even though if, and even though I'll, I will still watch it so I can be like, okay, I can get my opinion and be like, okay, I personally, to me, I like it or personally not, you know, so, so come and go so uh
Yeah. Oh. Now, my last mm-hmm. question here is so we can all enjoy, relax, you know, after a couple of hard questions, super easy going. What do you think that would be the title for this episode? Ava and Rebecca love TikTok. <laughs> no, I want to say something like AI and the authenticity of the human condition. That's wow. What I wow. That's okay. right. <laughs> That's Ava and Rebecca like have no I don't know that even means some... What? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, what did you say? Sir? I said Ava and Rebecca have no fear for the future. <laughs> That's what the <laughs> show is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, which one? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I was being very sarcastic. So we stick with the first one. Oh my God! No, no, no! No, Don't, no, I'm, no I'm, kidding, I'm kidding! I'm kidding! I'm kidding! I'm kidding! I'm oh, no. <laughs> the second one. I mean, sorry. <laughs> I mean, if it, it's somewhat, I mean, does it even mean anything? AI and the authenticity of the human condition. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Sounds good to me. Sounds like I went to Harvard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, it sounds badass. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, at the end, what, at the end, what can I say, guys? I mean, it's incredible what you guys do. The fact that you, yeah, that, that you keep doing it, that you keep pushing to it, that you love it. I mean, it's incredible. And I mean, we all know that it's inevitable that at some point we're going to be chatting about the multiple thousands of thousands of projects you've been in because you're both incredible. And um, I do want to thank also those who, you know, stayed here, check it out on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Amazon and Google, I think, too. Thank you so much. As I said in the beginning, on the description below, you're going to find all of Rebecca and Neva's social media. Let's follow them. Make them viral. Hashtag Team Rebecca. Hashtag Team Eva. And guys, again, thank you so much for making this happen. Keep killing it. Keep rocking. And um, I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>